as it will all right folks if you'll take your seats we're ready for kickoff Good morning and welcome, and we'll have Rebecca Papia come up here as well. I'm Michelle Barefoot. I'm the Executive Director of the Benzie Area Chamber of Commerce. We welcome you today to our annual Benzie Chamber Summit to give you an update on the state of Benzie. Just a few housekeeping notes. If you could switch your mobile devices to vibrate or silent to ensure all attendees have a great event free of distractions. We would like to give special thanks to our breakfast sponsor, Honor Bank. Norm and his team are happy to help you with any and all of your financial needs. Breakfast and coffee will be available until about 11 a.m. The lower level can be accessed via the elevator during the event. Lunch will be provided at the conclusion of the summit on the lower level and sponsored by Cherryland Electric Co-op. The Benzie Area Chamber of Commerce worked hard these last three years to define our identity after the departure of the Visitors Bureau. We advocate for our members as well as the business community at large. We work as to bring you great programming like the annual Chamber Summit, our annual awards banquet that will be held next month, our annual golf outing, quarterly business enrichment programming, and of course, our monthly networking and functions. As a part of our Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance, along with 14 other chambers from Manistee and North, uh, we provide a collective voice to influence federal, state, and local legislation. So sit back and learn about all the great things that are going on in Benzie County. And without further ado, Bill Kennis, our chairman of our Advocacy and Awareness Council. Thank you, Michelle. You guys, uh, thank you for coming. This is a great attendance. What a beautiful morning. And um, Michelle Barefoot, man, she coordinated all this, brought you all here, promoted it. Please uh, a warm applause for Michelle. All right, guys, our team has changed, right? A year ago, uh, we would have had Senator Vanderwall up here and we would have had representative Jack O'Malley, but now we have uh, three new representatives and I'm thrilled um, part of the reason of having this event on Monday is so we could accommodate their schedules. So I'll introduce them uh, one at a time, uh, but um, Senator Bumstead is a, a senior member and um, certainly a, a seasoned uh, professional. And uh, we're gonna let each one of um, our elected officials uh, say a few words and then we're gonna just have some dialogue but this is gonna be a quick half an hour and I'm not sure that we're gonna get into questions. So let me introduce uh, Senator Bumstead to say a few words, tell you about some of the things he's working on in the committees. Senator Bumstead. Good morning, everybody. I'm passing around a few cards here. I didn't bring them up for everybody, but if you have a pen in your hand, I'll give you my cell phone. It's 231. 
250-0654. That's the cell phone that I carry. Also on the card, there's all the office information of uh, my staff. You need to call and get some information. Uh, with redistricting, my house seat when I was in the house in Wago County, Oceana County, and uh, Lake County. My original Senate seat was Nuevo, Oceana, and Muskegon County. Now with redistricting, it's Muskegon County, except the three eastern townships in Muskegon County, all of Oceana, all of Mason, Manistee, except for the three eastern townships, and all of Benzie. So now I have five Lakeshore counties. I probably have uh, the nicest five counties in the United States with all uh, the Gold Coast. And uh, happy to represent the, these counties. But learning Benzie, learning Manistee, and learning Mason, it's uh, went from a 55 minute drive, the longest drive I ever had, to two and a half hours. So now it's it's a drive. So I do have a district gal in Muskegon. Her name is Christine Akterhoff. She takes a lot of pressure off the office and me. She can attend a lot of meetings in Muskegon while I'm up here because you can't drive this district in one day and do it justice. So we usually will schedule meetings up here in the three northern town counties, then she'll attend meetings down there. So it's just such a large area. The only way we can do that is uh, have to have a district gal in the office. We have two, kind of two and a half, is to be there part time. Uh, I've been in the legislature longer than there's four of us have been there since 2011. I've always been on appropriations. I'm minority chair, vice chair of appropriations. I'm minority vice chair of DNR budget, Eagle budget. So I'm also on five other committees. I'm one of the few Republicans that's actually on seven committees. But uh, with a good staff, you're on a lot of committees. And I've always been on appropriations. I really enjoy the money side of things and Trying to figure out and balancing the budgets and the departments. So I have a good rapport with, it didn't matter if it was Governor, Governor Whitmer appointing the directors or Governor Snyder. I always made it a point to get to know the directors very well and that benefits the district a lot. So I can make a call to the directors personally. I've known them over the years. Having that, those years of experience in Lansing really help. And because you, you have a lot of new members, 55 new members in the house this year. And half the caucus. Not that they're bad people, it's just they're, they're, they're learning. It takes a while to learn. And, uh, and that's the problem lines we have is staffing too. You come in, sometimes the staff are new, trying to learn how the process works. And it's, it's not easy for a new member to come in. And uh, luckily I've had staff with me for 10 years and it makes a big difference. And you know, going to Lansing for me wasn't good on there. I wanna pass 300 bills. It's doing the constituent work. If we if somebody calls our office, we try to fix those issues. If it's unemployment issues, like since COVID, since 2020, our office has done literally thousands of unemployment issues. So to me, our number one job in Lansing should be when people call from your district, let's help them through the process in Lansing because it can be very cumbersome at times to say the least. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, Mary have three kids. They're all over the place, Florida, Michigan, four grandkids, and, uh, but it's, it's truly an honor, but I really do enjoy doing the district work and meeting people. So here today, let's take some questions. Are we taking questions? You said no. I, I've got, I've got it back on. Oh. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, John, normally I would go, because you're se seasoned and senior, but we're going to go ladies first. Do you mind? No, not at all. Okay. So uh, Betsy Kofia uh, captures the northern part of our county, uh, kind of Lake Ann, and uh, she's a, a seasoned uh, elected official, but this is her first time in the House, and we're thrilled to have her representing part of Betsy Co Co County, Bet Betsy Kofia. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here. And yes, I, I do come from local government, which is helpful in terms of um, learning the ropes a bit. I was a county commissioner in Grand Traverse County for two terms starting in 2018. And so directly interacting with the state government, advocating on behalf of our local communities. But yeah, was elected uh, this past November um, to the new 103rd. So everything got moved around with redistricting, right? So just quickly, Leelanau County, all of it, 
half of Grand Traverse County, the sort of um, Bay Shore side, so the city of Traverse City and the immediately surrounding townships. And then Benzie County had two townships in Benzie, uh, Lake and area, so Platt and Elmira townships. And um, it was important to me to actually start my legislative coffee hours in Benzie. So later today at the Red Door in Lake Ann, we will have our first coffee hour. So feel free to swing by, it's at one o'clock. Um, so very quickly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a Northern Michigan kid. I was one of those people lucky enough to grow up up here out in Kilkaska County in a working class family. My mom cleans houses for a living. My first job was helping her vacuum and dust for her clients and grew up in a family that, like so many up here, worked very hard, worked paycheck to paycheck, and that taught me a lot of things that, frankly, pushed me into public service because I believe our leaders can help make all of our families' lives better and get access to things like health care, child care, mental health, uh, supporting our small businesses. That's why I'm in government. Um, professionally, my background in journalism, I was a small town newspaper editor for many years, so covered school board to state government, taught me a lot. And then I put myself through college at NMC. I worked three jobs, uh, like a lot of our young people in this region in order to be able to stay here. And I got my degree in social work. I have worked as a Head Start social worker for the three county area. So Grand Traverse, Benzie, and Leelanau, five child cares, dozens of, um, families of small children and again that pushed me more into government because I got a let's just say a front row seat on where some of our systems mean well but actually um, it's very challenging for families to move up and out of poverty. So um, I mentioned the area I represent. Um, Senator Bumstead is right there's a lot to learn in the legislature. I do know where the bathroom is so check in my first month I found my way around and I did it was important to me to hire staff with experience in Lansing but also it's three hours away. So it's very important to me to have an in-district presence. Um, some of you may know Renee McCauley. Does anybody know Renee? I just hired her as my district liaison. So she will be present in the district, staffing coffee hours, attending meetings that I cannot because I'm in session. And it is she's doing regular reports and helping me set up meetings. So she'll be a person uh, to reach out to uh, to help arrange local events. So key focuses for me are directly informed by my lived experience, what I saw as a social worker and a journalist, and then as a county commissioner. And then last year, knocking 45,000 doors, we heard a lot of things that have really stuck in my mind in terms of focus and priority. And they directly relate, for example, supporting our small businesses and economy. And they are things like housing costs, um, that that is a direct impact on our ability to attract and retain talent to this region. Uh, child care, another huge issue. Last, I saw a stat recently that Grand Traverse County has the longest wait list of all 83 counties for child care, and we lost a third of our child care providers during the pandemic. So these are huge issues for me that I am down there to work on on our behalf. Um, mental health, obviously that's another critical issue. One of my last actions as a county commissioner was to vote to set aside five million in ARPA dollars to hopefully have a crisis mental wellness center right here in the region to address this, this crisis. Obviously taking care of our clean air, our land and water and balancing why we live here, make sure we protect what we have. Supporting our public education system. I was a classroom, uh, uh, not teacher, but assistant and a special ed assistant. That was one of my jobs in college. And I've seen the way a lot of the supports that were used to be there for our kids has sort of been cut away. We're back on a good path now to reinstating those things, but I want to continue to support that happening. And um, I will just tie in, I requested committee assignments based on um, some of those key priorities for our district. So I'm on five committees. Uh, they are agriculture. I'm on that with John, my friend, uh, Representative Roth here. Higher education. As a proud NMC alum, I was very excited to get named in higher education to advocate for the importance of community colleges and uh, certificate programs to advancing um, our economic prospects, as well as agriculture, higher ed, economic development, which I'm also on with uh, Representative Roth, health policy, and families, children, and seniors. And with each of these committee assignments, I, I like those assignments because they match well with some of the, the priorities of our region. My job down there is to advocate for this region and to work with whoever I need to. We know that rural issues around housing, healthcare, mental health are not the same necessarily all the time as suburban and urban areas. 
So my job is to always look at it through the lens of this region and how do I have help make sure we have a seat at the table. So proud to be here. Thank you for uh, your time and attention. We represent it in Kofia. So uh, at the red door, it's uh, coffee with Kofia, probably. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. And uh, Representative Roth, uh, he's he's known where the bathrooms have been for a long time in Lansing. And uh, he, he's a seasoned guy, and we're really thrilled to have him here in Benzie County. Representative Roth. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate it so you can enlighten me on the things that we need to work on for you. That's our thing. As all everybody said, constituent work is number one. It's fun when you get a bill or two passed. That is pretty cool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not disliking that. But when you help people back home during the pandemic, the unemployment situation was not good. And uh, we helped crop well. My front desk staff, Adam, at the time, I you know, told somebody Adam was still my front desk, but he left me the trader. So uh, Alex is the front desk now, but Adam got so good at the unemployment situation, other counties were calling us and working with our office to get their unemployment issues done because we knew what he was doing. And I really appreciate Adam for that. Um, it's nice to have a new district. It's kind of fun, okay? I had one county my first term. I do know where the bathrooms are. There's a secret bathroom on the fourth floor. You gotta learn up the Capitol. You need to learn about that. That's always a good one to sneak away to. But uh, uh, first term was only Grand Traverse County. Had a lot of fun with that. It was neat to get to know that. And then redistricting occurred and it changed everything. Uh, now I have six counties. Uh, Manistee, but not the city of Manistee. Benzie, but not Lake Ann. Uh, Grand Traverse County, interlocking through to Fife Lake up to half of the casino. Betsy and I share half of the Turtle Creek Casino. I have the food, and that's all that matters. <laughs> I don't really gamble a whole lot, so that's okay. Um, and then we have uh, Wexford County. We have Buckley, the four townships that include Buckley. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have Kalkaska, but not the six counties on the outside of Kalkaska, just everything downtown. Then Antrim County, but not Mancelona or Star Wagner Township. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. You got to you gotta kind of pick out which road actually belongs to you and you're not getting in somebody else's district on the other side of the road. But uh, I, I enjoy the challenge. Again, it's as Senator Bunch said, it's at the uh, well, lakefront. I've got a lot of lakefront now. I lost my Grand Traverse County and I never had any. But uh, gained everything else along the lakeshore from Manistee all the way up to top of Antrim County, almost uh, uh, almost into Charlotte. So. I think I got better waterfront, actually. Sorry, Senator. Uh, been really blessed um, that I got to know what I was doing during the first term. That first term is rough. Um, you are trying to, it is, and I know everybody hates the word, you're drinking a fire hose. You are. So much comes at you that you don't even realize what's going on. And then all of a sudden you're spouting it like you know what you're talking about. It does come around. You do learn a lot more than you think you do. But uh, getting into my second term now, it's nicer because I can engage in a lot of the department heads. First term, you were afraid to call a department head. Oh, my God, they might yell at me or something. Uh, uh, we did do it a couple of times. We got used to it. But now in the second term, you're very comfortable calling a department head and saying, what's going on? I need, I need some more information. So happy to do that. I am on four committees. I was given generous committees. Uh, on agriculture, economic development, small business, health policy, and transportation. Transportation is going to be very key because it doesn't matter who's in charge, whether it's one side or the other, Act 51 keeps coming up every single time. And we're already hearing some Act 51 stuff, which for those that don't know what that means, it's how our monies get transferred to our county road commissions. And Three counties in particular, even though Grand Traverse County is a donor county, if you will, um, three counties, Oakland, Macomb, and Wayne, want their money back. And every time, they pay more in than they ever get back. Well, I, I understand why you'd be upset with that, Grand Traverse County, too, but we can't forget our friends. What about Benzie County, Manistee, Lake County? Without Act 51, Lake County would get nothing. Um, so we got to be tough on that. And uh, that's what we do on the committees. I'm uh, looking forward to getting into more committee action coming up, um, but happy to work for you. I've already done six coffee hours a week ago. Um, so I'm getting to know the new area really well and hearing from everybody and the needs and the wants and the concerns. So 
Uh, we will keep doing that. I think in the first month, probably had 30 meetings. So uh, we'll keep going. And we want to hear what, from you guys what you need. So appreciate the time. Thank you. Right. 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 I don't think we should sit down for you. Oh, oh. All right. Um, Short-term housing. You were one of the leaders um, over the last few years, and um, we all know about the bill, and uh, Frankfurt and some other communities have done some things. Can you give us an update on short-term housing? It's dead. <laughs> that may, make it pretty clear. It is The bill that got passed out of the house is dead. Um, the short-term rental issue with that bill is done. It's dead. Um, the Senate did not, they played with it for a while, trying to make it maybe better than what it passed out of the House. I was on, I was a co-sponsor, and I've learned a little lesson with that. You don't co-sponsor anything unless you're 100% for it. I figured if I co-sponsored, they'd talk to me about making the bill better, we could work on this, and committee. No, I was 100% yes in their eyes. So Jack O'Malley was against it 100% from day one. They talked to him every day. He was right next to me, so I kept hearing him come over and talk to Jack about short-term rentals. It's like, what about me? Now, made a mistake by co-sponsoring that bill. Learned a lesson. Um, if you want to, you don't co-sponsor, maybe say no, and they'll come around and we can work, work on it. But uh, the bill, as is, did not pass the Senate. Um, and as of December 28, 2022, sine die means the end of the session, all bills that didn't pass or get to the governor for signature died, and that one did. So I've heard people talk about some different things, but right now I'm not hearing anything serious. So we'll see, we'll see. Well, thank you for that update. And I, I can't speak for everyone in the room, but I think most would say uh, local control is very important. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, Frankfurt uh, passed a, a law that says uh, 120 uh, rental units. So that's 10% uh, of the population and they've, already given out 120 permits. So some some communities are stepping up. And, and I do, and thank you for that, Joel, because I still will say, if you're a village and municipality of any kind, pass your own ordinance, get it done. If you get yours done, and we see that most or, uh, townships have an ordinance of some sort, and I don't care what it looks like, the state's not going to come down on you. It was a few townships, mainly in Grand Traverse County and a couple other places, that said, no, we're not doing short-term rentals. And by the way, we don't have any short-term rentals. They just tucked their head in the sand and said, we're not, we're not going to deal with short-term rentals. Well, okay. Thank you for that. All right. Um, we don't have a lot of time, uh, but we're going to talk about infrastructure because, of course, the, the big three are, you know, um, broadband and, and housing and, and child care. Um, Betsy or uh, Senator Bumstead, you want to speak on any of those infrastructure issues? Um, Broadband's been, you know, we all need broadband, especially with COVID, you know, having your kids at home and schooling and that. It's coming. It's just going to take us a while. And so broadband, the folks that put it in are like everybody else. They don't, they don't have the workers either. It's just going to take us time to get it in. Fortunately, we have a lot of the rural electrics helping out in that direction. They got a lot of federal grants uh, to put that in, like Great Lakes Energy. I believe Cherryland's getting some. And it's slowly but surely going to come out. It's just going to take a while. You know, when you say we're going to get it everywhere, and we've got a lot of roads, a lot of communities in rural areas. It just, it takes time. So that's, that's a big priority for everybody in Lansing. I, that, that's not a Republican or Democratic thing. We all want it. It's something that we need to have. So I'll talk about uh, the housing issue a little bit. Um, I we have to have local control on the short-term rental issue. I do I do see that as a critical piece, and I don't think that's a partisan thing coming from local government. Um, yeah, that's really important to me. And so any any way to address uh, short-term rentals, I do believe has to preserve local communities' abilities because it's different if you're Southfield or the Keweenaw or Detroit, you know, the needs are gonna be a little different and I don't believe the state can give a one size fits all uh, edict from on high to tell our local communities how to address this issue. But that's just the start as far as I'm concerned. And what I, I have this approach to governing that I'm a generalist and if I'm smart, I'm gonna talk to the people with the actual expertise on the issue. So I see Yarrow Brown here. Yarrow, where are you? Wave at me, there you go. 
Yaro uh, and I have talked quite a bit uh, in, in terms of uh, hearing from Housing North. I see John Stimson here, right? Tony Lenti, um, as well as uh, Sarah Lucas. I've burned up her phone line quite a bit. She knows so much about all sorts of rural issues, whether it's broadband, band, but housing. And so I am really proceeding thoughtfully in terms of what policies can actually be helpful um, versus well-intentioned with unintended consequences to the local community. But one thing I did hear from Sarah in particular um, was that Michigan, unlike a lot of other states, has not had a dedicated line item in our annual budget specific to housing and that that is something we really do need to do. Uh, there's lots more we need to do um, to make sure that those funds actually come, for example, to rural communities where it can be very hard to be competitive for million dollars uh, with urban communities. But I'm excited that one of the bills we got to vote on last week actually does build in a dedicated line item for housing. It's, it's seed money, it's only 50 million a year over the next three years, but it is then in perpetuity. So that feels like an important step, um, just a small step. I'm not overselling it and there's a lot more work to do, but um, you can rely on me as I'm proceeding on things like infrastructure and housing to be engaging directly with the people from this region who understand the issue firsthand. And last thing I'll say is 45,000 doors knocked. Again, that was one of the top issues I heard on the doors, whether it was young professionals leaving our area because they could not afford the rents or some of our largest employers saying, we got it. We need the state to be a better partner on housing. So there you go. Thank you. And you know, guys, I know this feels really fast and this won't be the only time I, I feel uh, very uh, privileged to have them make time for us and um, the chamber efficacy and awareness. We will invite them back and we will have more opportunities for you to engage with them. Um, uh, Representative Roth, um, last comments? I wouldn't just add on what Betsy had to say. I think it's good that, that one positive of a high inflation or interest rate right now is the seven dollars $800,000 homes that were being built like, like nothing uh, are stopped or slowed down a lot. So these builders do need things to do. And I am seeing a lot of lower cost homes, uh, apartments going in and being built. Um, what we have to do is make sure it's done smartly. Can't stick a thousand units in an 80 acre parcel somewhere in a city and expect that to be just okay. But to make sure it's good, make sure it's done equitably around the way. We have a lot of communities that could take it, and let's just do it right. But I do see positive uh, things with, with what's going on right now. Thank you. And Senator, um, infrastructure, last comments? I could go on for hours. We know that. It just depends on what kind of infrastructure we're talking about. If it's home infrastructure or road infrastructure, to me, it's What's fair in the state is road, you know, how do we get our roads fixed? And you look at the last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of money put towards roads, but it's, it's not enough yet. Uh, it just takes time, it's like the road construction companies are in the same situation. They don't have enough employees either. You know, if I was gonna invest in a road crew, I wouldn't invest in Michigan. You can only work seven months a year here. I would invest in Tennessee and South where you can keep your crews busy year round. So a lot of it is it's not so much the dollars, there's dollars there. We just don't have the crews or the capability of fixing all the roads all at one time. So we're just gonna have spots in Michigan where they're just gonna have rough roads until, you know, some years we only get six or seven months to fix the roads. There's plenty of dollars, you just don't have the crews to do that. But, uh, you know, when I came into the house in 2011, our economy was bad. It was almost 15% unemployment. We had less than $2 million in the rainy day fund or in the bank, enough to run the state for, I think it was 15 minutes. And over the years, we put a lot of policies in place that work. It's really all about how do we spend your money and the taxpayer money wisely. And uh, that's what we need to really concentrate on. How do we get the most bang for our buck without, you know, charging people more. And we need to live, the state needs to live with our means like everybody else has in these, you know, last couple of years of the economy and price of things. Well, folks, I really appreciate you making time. Uh, these are a hundred of the leaders in the community representing businesses and uh, nonprofits, uh, townships and villages. And I hope this won't be the only time you visit us. So thank you guys. Give it up for our representatives.
Yeah. All right. Um, well, she's not as new as some of those representatives, but uh, she's certainly brought a lot of energy to our county, and we really appreciate um, that Katie's uh, made some time for us. And Katie, um, you didn't have to yield any of your time to them. Okay, so I'm going to start the clock. Three minutes. Uh, no, that's right. Oh, you have all 15. Thanks, Beth. How is everybody? Good? Happy Monday. <laughs> I want to thank you all for inviting me here. Again, I'm Katie Zeitz, the County Administrator for Benzie County. I've served Benzie County almost two years now, so it's an exciting feat to be here. I'm blessed and thankful that the board took a chance on me, um, so it's been fun. Some of the things we've been working on in Benzie County, um, one thing that I heard when I came on was transparency and efficiency is lacked. And so that's one of the things we've really been working on here in Benzie. We're now streaming our uh, meetings on YouTube. Super exciting. Um, we didn't think we'd get more than 10 views in the first week and we had 40. So that's a really exciting thing for us. Um, we're also working on a website, a new website that will be accessible to all this, all abilities which we felt was very important too. We really wanted to have more um, support and more uh, interaction with the community because that was one of the things we heard. So we've been focusing on those things quite a bit. Some of the community impact we've had, um, we received ARPA dollars like many other um, organizations and we've been using that to really invest in our community. Uh, we've supported a housing project with Homestretch as well as the Frankfurt Area Land Trust. Um, we're supporting a broadband project here in Benzie County, partnering with Cherry Capital. So huge improvements to Benzie County and really getting involved in the community and supporting our neighbors. We've also helped to support a feasibility study for Stewart uh, with Benzoni and Fula. So just another way that we're helping to support our neighbors here in Benzie. Some of the internal things I've been working on, you know, streamlining operations and efficiencies. We've worked on policy quite a bit and upgrade, upgrading those policies. We've also worked to streamline different things that we're doing so that things are done faster and more efficient. We've been partnering with other local agencies just to help support them. We've also worked to improve services. Uh, one hot topic is animal control. We're now open five days a week to adopt animals, which is a huge improvement for the animals that we have in that building. We're also going forward, gonna be working to really define economic development for Benzie County. Economic development's been around for years. But we don't really, we don't have a clear direction moving forward. We're also working to continue to improve our fiscal responsibilities. This budget this year was the first time we balanced the general fund budget without fund balance in quite a few years. So that was a huge and exciting task that we were able to accomplish. I did put in the back a budget at a glance. Anybody's welcome to take one. This kind of gives a nice overview of what we're doing at Benzie County government, the money that we're investing in, in the community. Almost $8 million in public safety to support our community. It's really exciting. It also talks about the different services we offer for supporting our veterans. Most recently, we uh, made that office a full-time office in Benzie County and made it an actual department of Benzie County versus a contracted services because we know that veterans are so important to our community. I don't know what I had for talking points. <laughs> it never take long. Do you have any questions for me, Bill? I'm well, sure, Katie. And um, yeah, you said you had 45. You really got through 45 that quickly? No, I said I had 425. Oh, 425. <laughs> four I didn't come off of 45. Okay, what am I missing? All right. Well, um, so you, you want to talk a little more about uh, broadband and um, the roll-up points? Sure. So. Um, we have been working with Cherry Capital Communication, Tim Malone is here, and we're working to put together a broadband project to expand broadband in Benzie County to almost 2,000 homes. Um, we have committed up to $1.5 million of county funds towards that project, and the hope of this project is that it will be um, demonstration for more grant funds at the state and federal level to expand broadband to the entire county. Our goal is to connect the unconnected first and the underconnected, and then go from there. Um, we know that broadband is a huge issue in Benzie County. When I first came on board, we were doing a survey to just see how big that need was. 
And we learned that that need was tremendous, that over 90% of people did not have adequate internet in Benzie County. It's a very sad thing. So we're working hard to partner with organizations to expand broadband to the community and to the students. Yeah, and I know we're gonna talk about uh, more broadband and, and water and uh, master planning and so many great things here. Um, maybe we can uh, take a couple of questions um, uh, from the audience. Yes. Um, in that 1.5 million, in that 1.5 million that you said that uh, the county was providing for, did that come out of ARPA funds or did that come out of taxpayer funds? And also, if you have 2,000 that you're going to service, how much money per unit is that going to cost to get to those units uh, as far as the broadband is concerned? In other words, it's going to a house to provide internet. So how much of, of the dollar is going per each house of those 2,000 units? Um, so the first part I'll address is where the funding is coming from. Um, some of those funds will indeed come from ARPA, others will come from general fund dollars, all tax, tax dollars at the end of the day. Um, but we've identified that need here in Benzie, broadband and housing, which we've also given funds to. Um, our project by us committing 1.5 million it turns out to be about a $5.2 million project in Benzie County. So our 1.5 is part of the much bigger picture. Our $1.5 million, and we've said this over and over again in our conversations with Mr. Malone, is that our 1.5 million, we'd like to specifically benefit the household. And so our funding will help bring down those connection um, hookup services that Cherry Capital will offer. As far as an exact number, I don't. I don't have an exact number as of yet. Okay, so then the five million five is, is going to just hit two thousand households. It's very expensive to expand broadband. So is most of that rural, or is it? So it'll be unserved areas first. And so we're working on defining those specific locations. But what our goal was is to connect the unserved first because the underserved, they have something. So unserved and then move on to those underserved folks. So when are you gonna have available, which ones of the unserved uh, areas are going to possibly have the internet? We're working on that now with Cherry Capital to but define I, those maps. Will, will, you, will you publish that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we will have a public available map for folks to see the general areas where we'll be responding growing and fencing. So can I just ask one more question? Where is the rest of the, if, if Menzies 1.5, where is the rest of the 5.2 coming? Cherry Capital is investing their money into Benzie County as well. Thank you, Dana. Uh, other questions? Must have nailed it, Katie. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for bringing us back on schedule and thank you for your time. Where is Art Jeanette? There he is. All right. Uh, everybody knows Art, certainly in the community. He's one of our uh, leading statesmen in our community. I've uh, been involved in so many projects, and we appreciate Art making time for us. For those of you that I've not met before, my name's Art Jeanette. I've been in the community about 25 years. Spent 30 years in banking, the last 12 of those as CEO. For that, for the Honor Bank. In 2009, I decided to reinvent myself and I started building affordable housing. Two of my projects in Benzie County, Edenbrook Place and Gateway Village. And uh, it's very satisfying to be a part of that. I concentrate only on rural communities. Uh, before I get too much further uh, about the chamber, you know, I've been with, involved with the chamber a long time. Healthy chambers and communities make healthy communities. Not many years ago, the chamber board had to take a step back and say, what do we look like today now that we're not a tourism bureau? And I'll tell you that I was one of the first to, to really be very cautious about what the outcome would be. I can't tell you how impressed I am that that leadership group stood up, took, took stock of what they thought they could provide. You're gonna find most of it now is about advocacy in the legislative area. Now, Michelle, the communication that you put out is second to none. No one would even know that you're the only staff there. So 
Good job to the cave chamber. Round of applause, please. I do want to recognize a couple of uh, people that will be that sit on the EDC with me. I would like if you'd stand up and be recognized a moment. I'm looking around. Dan, if you would, please. And we do have five other members of the board that are here today, but certainly play a key part. Much of what the EDC is doing is already going to be talked about today or already has been touched on. Broadband, we have been waist deep in that. The um, we, were, we were able to put enough confidence together for the commissioners that they committed that 1.5 million. Prior to that, they had committed up to 200,000 for a consultant because none of us really understands that business well enough to be able to move the community forward. So I applaud the commissioners for having the confidence to do that. That's not something we've seen historically. Housing, we touch on in the fringe, the fringe but we're gonna be talking about that today also. So let me talk a moment about where the EDC has been and where it's going. In the mid eighties, the EDC was formed pretty much for the exclusive purpose of being able to re receive a, a rural development fund for the purpose of revolving loan fund. And those monies were to be used in this community to do what is referred to as gap financing. That program stood in place until about four years ago. And about four years ago, we committed those funds then to Venture North that would be able to use our funds as well as other funds uh, to for businesses within the region. So that's where we've been. After the, after the responsibility of the revolving loan fund was over, we began wondering what is our role anyway and couldn't have been more excited than to take the lead position in uh, uh, the broadband effort. And there are, when I first started with that effort with the group, I naively thought 18 months will have 80% of the community covered. Well, I learned within a year that that was just not possible. There's been some questions about timelines today. I can tell you that uh, we're probably three to five years out before we hit all of the market that we hope to, and Tim will speak more to that. But our end goal is, is to make sure that it's available, reliable, and affordable. And you'll learn, I hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about that. 35% of our student population didn't have access to broadband. Well, what's that say about our education system? So that was an important project, but now we're in the phase of that project that it requires a different kind of oversight. The uh, EDC board will continue to follow it through, but now we're asking ourselves, what does the EDC look like for the future? I've been, this is my third economic development corporation that I've sat on. The other two always had a private public partnership. They were responsible directly for the growth in the community, growth that the community wanted, not just simply what the, uh, uh, the EDC board wanted. So we're questioning ourselves now about what does that look like? I've asked the commissioners to tell me, what do they think that looks like? But I believe that in order to be healthy with the right partnerships, uh, the EDC is gonna to continue to contribute things like access for grant dollars, managing relationships with Venture North, looking for prospects to build affordable housing. Our community desperately needs some type of business or industrial park in order for us to move forward. Manufacturing is still, still the key today, folks, to good paying jobs. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that they don't come and then you build it. You build it and then they come. Most businesses that are looking to relocate or expand are about 12 months into the market before we even know that's gonna happen. I think that one of the best tools we can do as an EDC is make sure we're being responsive to our current our business owners through retention calls. We've had a couple of businesses in recent years that went from 250 to 275 employees, closed their doors, and the county wasn't even aware that it was coming. We just can't allow that to happen. When business owners start looking at your community, one of the things they do is they go to business, other business owners. They wanna know, you know, what does government look like? What does education look like? 
Is it a friendly community of business? If we're out there, even if we can't provide a need for that business owner right now, if they understand that we deeply care about their success, they can answer positively uh, when asked that question. So what I would look for as we go forward, I think the key components is that we're gonna be looking for a private public partnership. I wanna be real clear that this is kind of my vision at the moment, as well as some others that I've sat down with uh, privately when I'm wanting to understand based on their experience what they see. That that group would be responsible for business retention, would be proactive for uh, future growth. Nothing gets done well unless somebody wakes up every morning thinking about that subject. So I believe that we need a staff or at least a paid professional to guide us through that. I think it's possible that that position can accommodate things like parks and rec also, uh, but that's yet to be seen. And by the way, I guess I should digress for a moment. Parks and rec is doing a study right now to see what's the best way for them to manage our assets. And one of the things that we've asked them to do is, could we collaborate either with other communities or other activities within the community? We're also a broadband or a brownfield authority, which is simply a tool for economic development. We've had modest need for that right now, but uh, the project in honor where the old Bud gas station was, uh, we're involved in that project. We're involved in a project at the old high school off of um, Stapleton's Corners. I know personally that I was involved in Brownfield when we built Gateway Village. So there is a, a role for that, but that's simply a tool. The other tool that we're lucky to have is the land bank because there's various things we can do at the land bank that allows us then to recruit people with certain incentives to that housing building or to do that new, new business building. I want to take a moment, by the way, that land bank is Shelly Thompson's uh, responsibility. I read in the paper not long ago, they were talking about the Brownfields and holding it. The truth of the matter is, Shelly Thompson sourced that project, I believe, in honor. You got to write about that? They went to home stretch, so she was a big part of that. So these are tools that we want to use. Um, Bill, I'm not sure that I, I need to go on. No, you're doing fine um, and, and bridging uh, the, the business interests uh, with, with the county and the EDC. Um, do you want to see if there's any any questions? I know we're ca capturing some of these. Uh, yeah, Nina? So um, if I'm correct, the county doesn't have a planning or zoning department at this time? 2010, zoning was put back to the township. Okay, correct. And that's what I'm... Um, pointing out with all of what the county wants to do, perhaps the commission can figure out how to come up with some money for a planner because we have 12 municipalities, including um, townships in the city of Frankfurt, that don't have any umbrella that they can go to a planner to uh, provide what you're talking about for EDC and everything else as far as uh, manufacturing development, uh, housing development, nobody to, to kind of sit on top and see over how they're meshing from township to township in their zoning and in their planning. When is Benzie County Commission going to start looking at that again? We consider ourselves to be conveners of that activity now but we've spent a lot of time in the last few years just organizing the administrative part of it and modernizing our practices. So now we can start looking at things that you just described. Uh, although I'll tell you that Networks Northwest has been a great resource for most of our community. And they can join hand in hand with even a part-time planner. At one time, uh, Benzie County was talking about being uh, a dual, doing something and collaborating with Manistee County. We don't have anything now in the works I mean, that I see. We have, in the 25 years I've been here, we've partnered both with Traverse City on a couple of occasions and then with Manistee, an organization out of Manistee. Uh, quite frankly, I think it needs to be someone that's thinking about Benzie County every day. That's good. And those are discussions that we're beginning to have at the commission level. Okay, good. 
All right. Well, Art, I appreciate your time. And uh, we're just going to keep this agenda rolling. Uh, he's going to be around if you guys have any more questions. Thank you, Art. Well, Trevor, are you ready to rumble? All right. So uh, you guys are aware a couple of years ago, um, uh, um, the tourism uh, uh, CBB was rolled into Traverse City and uh, we've seen some really big things. Uh, and this is Trevor Kakach. He's the CEO of uh, Traverse City Tourism. Thank you. I'll be brief and in fact, I'll encourage those on that housing panel to start walking up because it's not gonna take me five minutes. I promise you that. There's far more important things to listen to today. Thank you, Michelle, for allowing me to be up here, allowing Traverse City Tourism sponsor. Uh, as Art was kind of pointing out a few years back when things kind of separated, uh, tourism, deciding to partner with Traverse City Tourism at the time, just prior to the pandemic and uh, the chamber stepping out on its own, it really has changed the dynamic. The voice is much different now and it helps us do in the tourism sector. And I won't speak on behalf of all of our properties and, and, and managers here in the audience who are part of that group here in Benzie County, but uh, we do rely on those voices to keep us tuned in. And, and there's a great deal of energy coming from this room in this community right now, which is excellent. Uh, we we have, uh, we're beholden to the state. We're, we're part of the MEDC. We work under Travel Michigan. They give us some guidelines and our board works within those confines to be successful. So there's really three things that we focus in on every day. Uh, marketing and partnerships. Marketing, clearly we market this area, we market this region, we're the poultry child of Pure Michigan. We wanna capitalize on that. And we try to do it all year round during need times, trying to make sure small businesses stay in business, make sure that people stay fully employed in this county. That's really important to us. Uh, two, destination development. This is huge. This is a really big and broad area where we're trying to do a lot of work. Uh, so that can include placemaking, putting investments back in the trail system, helping develop new events, or working on things like housing, investing uh, with the ROs group, uh, or putting dollars into the TriShare program so that people uh, who need child care support uh, can get more access to it at a better rate. And then we work on policy and funding. And that's a lot of the stuff that's happening here right now. When we sponsor events like this, when we get involved in the community, we get to understand better what the needs are of the community, how uh, that partners with the things that we're trying to achieve, and then we keep moving that ball forward. So we're an economic, uh, economic development tool uh, designed in our state and supported by our tourism industry. And so we're, we're excited to continue uh, working here. Just a couple of dates I want you to have on your calendars moving forward, and you're all welcome to these. On March 9th, uh, we will have our annual meeting in Traverse City, uh, which we will touch on some of the wonderful work that's been done here in Benson County over the past year. Uh, that's planned at the Great Wolf Lodge. Keep your eyes peeled, there will be RSVP uh, invites going out for that. Uh, also on April 19th, this is a fun one, those who work in the hospitality and tourism industry in Benzie County, we're gonna host uh, a thank you event at Five Tours in Beulah. Wonderful spot, we've hosted events here before. Uh, looking forward to get, getting back on, on that track and celebrating those people who are welcoming visitors to our region every day. So that's all I have. Again, I don't think I took five minutes and I'm really excited to hear this next panel because it's so important to all of us. Uh, Trevor, you know, I think most people in the room would be interested though in your advocacy for short-term rentals uh, to pay an equitable share to the TC Tourism Group, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a fairly um, straightforward issue for us. You know, those who work in that space, we try to make sure that there's parity with what we're looking for. We've got a lot of um, uh, hotel property management groups in Benzie County, Grand Travers, and other spaces we represent uh, that participate in this. And really for us, it's, it's more just about making sure that there's um, equity across the board. For anybody who wants to get into this business, I uh, won't get too uh, political about it or, or too finite, but you know, trying to maintain that local control, make sure dollars stay in the industry so those uh, who are collecting can help make decisions about how those dollars are spent uh, and then make sure regulation is fair and safe for everybody. I mean, that's really where we stand on it, which is consistent with what Travel Michigan has been pushing for as well, the Travel Commission. Yeah, and the Chamber and the Alliance have been solidly supporting you know, equity too. Uh, Beth, quick question. Uh, quick question is, you said you're a poster child for Pure Michigan. How are you connected with Pure Michigan? In a lot of ways. So the state offers up a partnership opportunity from a marketing promotional standpoint. And so those television ads that you've seen over the years, those are actually being updated this year. And you'll see some vivid, vivid imagery from Benzie County if you uh, look closely at those uh, upcoming ads. 
and other digital campaigns and things that keep us top of mind or push need times in partnership with uh, Travel Michigan. So the Pure Michigan dollars that are set aside, uh, some of those can be unlocked with a dollar from our market. And so when our board chooses to partner with Pure Michigan, we're unlocking more money to help promote and represent this region. Yeah, and wrapping up, guys, um, we appreciate the sponsorship of uh, TC Tourism for lots of chamber events, uh, the rotary bike events, uh, various things in the community. So um, you'll hear about that, um, it, but it should be more public about how much money is really coming back uh, to the county uh, directly. And we appreciate that, Trevor. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. All right, it's housing time. We have Pastor Jack Parnish, who's going to oversee this all-star panel. We really appreciate everyone coming out for this. So housing people, come on down. Yeah, that's great. Anyone need a stretch? You need a stretch break? Yeah. Let's stand up for a minute and just take a stretch. We'll count down about 10 seconds, but give yourself a stretch. Be my mom. Oh, that you guys didn't get this. Right? This is John Boston. I have no. Oh, I text him all the time. So those are your questions. Hi, how are you? Yeah, you know, I get it. Okay, you're feeling relaxed. Oh, yeah, I can find you. I did too. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Clearly, Part of the value of a day like this is the connecting that goes on, the networking. And so glad to have everyone here and to be a part of the day. Seven years ago, Advocates for Benzie County held community forums. Some of you were probably there and uh, raised what we all know to be one of the major issues in the county. That is workforce attainable housing. And we need to give a moment of sort of gratitude to my predecessor, uh, Rick Robb. Many of you know Rick and encountered Rick, and you know Rick was a tireless, sometimes tiring for the rest of us, but tireless advocate for workforce attainable housing in the county. And we give thanks for his leadership and work on that issue. This morning, uh, we have the representatives of people who are directly involved in addressing the issue of housing. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce all of you, and then we're going to begin with Yaro Brown, who gives us the overview from Housing North, and then John Stinson, Homestretch, Liz Nagru from the Land Trust, Jay White from the Housing Commission, and Bill Mary from Habitat. They're each going to comment on their individual a uh, part that they're playing in the progress we're making on housing. And then we'll open it up for some conversation between the, the uh, panel members. So Yaro, do you want to begin by giving us a uh, big picture? All right. Can and it's best me? if you stand up. I think people in the back can't see if you're seated. I can do that. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right. So I represent Housing North. We're a nonprofit that covers the 10 county region. So the same footprint as Networks Northwest. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard me or know about Housing North, just so I can get an idea. 
Okay, so so we're making the rounds. Um, so we um are, I guess, would say to start off, first of all, in Benson County, you guys are really doing an awesome job. You have a lot of the existing tools in place, some really great organizations. The county is really stepping up. Um, so I want to say there's great things happening, and I don't want to be a downer uh, with the numbers, but I do think you're in a really good place to move the needle on housing, and we're here to help. Um, so I would say we're really here. We focus on three areas all around housing, so I'm very biased uh, in the name. I'm focused all on housing, um, but we are here to focus on communications, advocacy, and capacity um, in our 10-county region, but also in your community. So we do have a Benzie County Collaborative that's meeting monthly, and I'll just say on the 22nd, we're hosting um, an event to talk about the new tools. So a lot of our work is advocating at both the state level but the local level to make sure our communities have the resources and tools uh, to make, put in housing and remove any barriers that exist. So we had four bills that passed the house and anybody who's an elected official, did you get my letter that talked about the Housing Michigan Coalition bills? Anybody? Did you get my letter? Okay, some people did. <laughs> so we're hosting an event to really help you understand what the tools are and how you can put them to use. Um, and there will be more opportunities. So we're part of the Housing Michigan Coalition. We sit on the executive committee uh, representing Northwest Michigan. So we are really here to be your regional advocate, advocate to now make sure resources and more tools come to your region. So reach out to me if you have a specific bill or legislative priority and I'll rep Roth. Uh, one of the bills we really worked hard on was a principal residence exemption, but that didn't make the cut this year. So principal resident exemption for those who um, are year-round property managers or have a second home, making sure their taxes are reduced um, so that they don't convert to a short-term rental and can provide workforce housing. So if you have priorities or bills that um, you really want us to be, you know, um, on and watching like community land trust bills. Um, that's really, I would say, where our voice is uh, to collectively represent you and make sure now that the tools have been passed and we have these tools that there are now resources that can come to your community to now um, help these projects come to fruition. Um, I'll just say two other things really quickly that we're working on is a housing needs assessment. So again, many of you might have already gotten my email, but we're updating our numbers. So um, we know that there's a huge need in our 10 county region, and we got those numbers in 2019, but that a lot has changed since 2019. And they project the need in our 10 county region from 2020 to 2024. So that was for people currently living here that needed housing, but also people who would move here um, if they could find housing. And that showed in Benzie County, you needed over 700 units. Um, so you're making a lot of progress towards that, but we still have more work to do to encourage more density. So we say we need diversity of housing, more opportunities across that income range. But the numbers do show that the majority of people needing housing in our region are making less than $60,000 a year. So we really do need to focus on housing across that income spectrum, but those who are currently living and working here, as well as opportunities for um, different types of housing, like ADUs or smaller square footage homes or converting homes into multiple. Uh, prop, you know, potential duplexes and triplexes. So um, I think that's the main points I wanted to make. We're here as a local and regional advocate. And if you come out on the 22nd next week to Bill Benzi, um, we're going to dive into those housing tools and we'll be hosting a meeting, meeting to go in deeper. So I'll stop talking and pass it on to the, the next person. John. Hello, I'm John with Home Stretch. I think you might be familiar with Home Stretch. Um, we were brought into Benzie County because of Michelle Thompson. Uh, as Art said, she's out of the land bank. Uh, we appreciated her doing that, and it's because of her efforts that brought us here. Um, I'm impressed, Art, that you were able to do two projects in Benzie County. I wish you would do more, and I know you've helped us in the past. I'm impressed that you still have a full head of hair. I've been pulling my hair out to try to get housing built as much as possible, and we've had some success. So I was asked today to give a little bit of a dissertation on the update for um, some of our projects in Benzie County. So you all know the Honor Village Apartments, um, that is now complete. We're um, almost at 100% occupancy, but there is a small tale to be told there. Yarrow said there are 700 units needed in the community. This is, you know, eight units to start. Um, the 60%, 80% AMI, that is true. 60% is about a threshold. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble getting our 80% units filled. Um, there's two left. So the first 30%, 50% units, they were taken right away. We had trouble with the 480, and like I said, we have two left right now. Um, to give you an idea of what the rents are at the low end, the 30% AMI units are uh, renting for about 300 per month. The um, 
50 and 60% units are at 700 per month. And then when we talk about 80% units, it jumps all the way up to 1200. And that's where we're having the problem. Um, utility allowance is 181 a month. So on top of that run, I just told you, there's an additional 181. Um, a little bit about the cost per square foot. Those units were at $174 per square foot. That's all in. That's infrastructure, um, excavating, parking lot, everything that you can imagine, except for soft costs, which are just the hard costs. Um, the total development was 200,000 uh, per unit, total development cost. So 200,000 per unit is what we needed to raise and we were able to. There was a source of capital that was six layers deep. And um, it could have been seven without the land bank donating the land. So I'll go to the next project, Frankfurt um, Lake and Maine, a uh, project that we are drawn into after um, the honor project. This is targeting 60 to 80% AMI. So we're not dipping down into the 30%. We're sticking with closer to the missing middle. And we are successful with Mishta's application for 600,000 for that project and grant funds. So hopefully the capital stack on that will be a, bit, a little bit less. Um, so rents, we are gonna have three units and these are all two bedroom, one and a half bath. Um, they're two story townhouses, about 980 square feet. So pretty good size. The rents are gonna be three units at 950 a month and nine units at 1150. So a little bit less on the higher end than honor because we had the higher end middle units. We didn't have the 30 percenters to help. You know, we had to make up that difference somewhere else in the income. Um, so it's 12 units, two bedroom, one and a half baths, as I said. The total cost per square foot on these is 210 per square foot for the construction and 237,000 per unit. So we're going up in cost, as you can see from the days of honor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that I hope will be something we could break ground in June or July, usually about a two year turnaround. By the time we get the land, raise the capital, and get the project in the ground. This actually is going to be about a six months turnaround. And I would say thanks to the city of Frankfurt um, and the group of people that came together to make this project a fruition. And it's going to happen, I guarantee it. Um, third project we're looking at is in Weldon Township. There's 32 units there that Crystal Mountain has land uh, sufficient for. Uh, we propose to do 16 units in that as a first phase and then another 16 units afterwards. Those will be 12, again, two bedroom um, and four, three bedroom. So a little bit different mix. We're putting some three bedrooms in there trying to capture some other families. Um, after that, we're gonna maybe talk to, and I've had meetings this week with the Platte River School rehabilitation or revamping of that project. So I think that'll be exciting. That might be a longer term project than what I'd like to do. It's gonna take a lot of work up front. But um, just a couple of concerns that I have, um, passive building design and 100% electrification. That's on the horizon right now. If we can build them as uh, energy efficient, then we can go all electric. And that's kind of our mission, or something I'm trying to strive for. Um, the concerns I have are tightening of credit. Interest rates are going up. The more they go up, the higher the rents or the more capital we need. So it's pushing a rock up a hill, a big boulder, actually. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Uh, bringing home to Dutch Frankfurt. We're excited uh, for that partnership. Uh, my name is Jay White, member of the Frankfurt Housing Commission in Frankfurt. Just wanted to share a little bit about where we were, where we are currently, and where we're planning to be. In the near future. So the Frankfurt Housing Commission really grew out of uh, a lot of discussion with the Frank, we called it the Frankfurt uh, Area Housing uh, Council. Uh, it was headed up and actually uh, our mayor Katie Khan and actually was pushing us on that in 2017 to get going on housing initiatives. So we did form uh, in 2020 the Frankfurt Housing Commission, uh, thanks to many uh, organizations that helped uh, with the information 
and influence uh, Housing North, uh, the Fair City Housing Commission. Uh, Tony came uh, down and helped us with a lot of thoughts on how to form. Um, and so we uh, were excited to to be a group. Uh, our current members, uh, Katie Condon, the uh, head up as our chair, I have Katie on that. Uh, Andy Miller uh, is our vice chair. I serve as secretary and we have members from the city council. Um, Mackenzie Stratton is on our housing commission. It's always important to tie uh, a committee to council for communication. And then we also have Eric Meddy, who's a, a, an area resident. So he lives in one of our three projects in Frankfurt and brings the perspective of the housing resident to us. Uh, we meet uh, every month at City Hall on uh, the second Thursday of each month at three o'clock. Uh, our meetings are open to the public and we encourage and welcome you to come join us in those conversations. Um, one of our first tasks was to really review uh, as a housing commission the needs of our community and the broader Benzie County. Um, and looking at the resources of the uh, Frankfurt Area Housing Advisory Council, they did a great um, uh, survey of our community. It uh, was uh, really um, uh, on the ground survey, kind of a simple one, but it garnered a lot of information, what our community thought about housing, uh, where we should go, what's important to them, those kind of things. Housing North, uh, certainly integral in, in our decisions, Networks Northwest, uh, MISHTA, study with MISHTA and what they're looking for, and of course, uh, HUD and, and other, um, other organizations. Uh, one of our, uh, another one of our first tasks is to identify partnerships. Who can we partner with to build housing? Obviously, a housing commission, you know, we're part of the city of Frankfurt. We're not going to build something, nor are we going to manage it. So we started looking for who out there can help us. Uh, first one came to us was uh, actually um, was Sox Development in Traverse City. They've done a number of studio units up there that's successful. Had worked with the Frank with the Traverse City Housing Commission successfully. So we invited John Sox and his group down to talk to us. Uh, we uh, did design a project that was 30 studio units uh, at the same site that we're now working with John on at the corner of Main Street and M22, which is Lake Street. Um, we were excited about the project, that, you know, and we learned a lot from going through that process. Unfortunately, based upon uh, construction costs and rising interest rates, Soon the rents, the proposed rents were getting beyond uh, what our community could uh, really support or really afford. Uh, and that's really one of the things is that uh, Sox is a for-profit company, whereas Homestretch is a nonprofit company. So we have um, access through a nonprofit to a lot more funding that will help us bring that rent rate down. So in the um, mid-summer last year, uh, we, uh, really kind of, we ended our relationship with Sox, a great company. Um, we were sad that, that it didn't work out. Uh, fortunately, we met uh, Don and Homestretch uh, over an honor to tour his project and members of the uh, Frankfurt Area Community Land Trust and, and the uh, Housing Commission both looking at Homestretch as a potential partner. Uh, it ended up that we became uh, their partners as the Frankfurt Housing Commission. And uh, we then uh, pushed forward. Um, with, uh, with actually great optimism that we could um, obtain uh, grant funding from Mishta. They had just announced a new program called the Missing Middle to really address um, funding needs uh, for um, you know, housing in that 60 to 120% of AMI, whereas most of their focus previously had always been focused, as, as Art will tell you, anything under 80% was their primary focus. So we were excited to, to be um, in a new partnership uh, with design that was pretty proven and already built and ready to move forward. Um, another thing that we accomplished uh, in 2020 was uh, really putting together uh, a group of, of very energetic, uh, I would say some of the younger folks in, in Frankfurt to carry out a mission of home ownership, uh, making sure that home ownership is affordable. So uh, we, we were instrumental in forming the Frankfurt Area Community, Community Land Trust uh, in 2020. Uh, they got their 501c3 shortly after that status. So they're they're up and running and Liz is gonna tell you more about that. But it really focuses yeah. on, if you think about our community, the Frankfurt Housing Commission, we're really focused on rentals. So we're gonna look for partners like John to help us build and then manage those, those projects for rental. We look at the Frankfurt uh, Area Community Land Trust, as a home ownership, making sure that home ownership is affordable for our workforce. 
Uh, so those are the really the, the, the two prong approach we're looking at in the Frankfurt area um, to to attack the housing needs. So where are we today? Um, actually, early in the summer of 2022, um, oops, I covered all that, sorry, I'll jump ahead here. Uh, and really just to kind of review on John, we're, we're very excited um, that Home Threat was successful in obtaining the Michigan grant and we have then approached um, uh, Benzie County, uh, the commissioners were uh, very receptive to our request uh, for additional funding there, uh, continued upon our receipt of the Michigan. So they challenged us to keep pushing um, to get that mission dollars into our community. Uh, that's where we're at today. Some of the things were, what are we, where are we going? What are we doing? Um, we understand that um, for any organization to to really flourish and do well in time, we need to continue to look forward and what are we gonna do next? What's on our plate? So we have identified a number of sites uh, in Frankfurt. Some of them are city owned and some are private where development, uh, housing development can take place. A couple of those in particular would be a uh, site on Day Avenue. Uh, there's a wetland area there that we're actually currently working with uh, Eagle on to determine whether or not that's a viable site for us. Uh, we also have a pretty good uh, sized site over on uh, Beach Street, uh, the north end of our town uh, that the city owns that could be uh, various uh, housing project uh, types. So mixed use uh, could be uh, rental, ownership, uh, seasonal. So we're already uh, at this point looking at uh, some land use study planning there uh, within the next year that we'll be endeavoring in. Uh, so what's made us successful? I think it's just a great team of people uh, coming together um, to work hard. We have a very supportive mayor, uh, city superintendent, they're at every meeting. Uh, city council has been supportive. The planning commission says, what do you need? How can we help you? Uh, Benzie County, the, our treasurer, the land bank, and uh, the commissioners have been very supportive. Uh, Mishta, great group of people. Once you get to know them on a one uh, first name basis, they'll call you back. They'll email, they'll return an email note uh, they really want to help. They have funding. They want to get it out there. Obviously, it has to be uh, justified okay. and, and, and work by their rules. But they're there, and they're they're really uh, great people to work with. Um, the Benzie Chamber, instrumental in helping us all come together through some monthly meetings. Uh, the school systems, Frankfurt and Benzie Schools, both being supportive. And we're talking about some exciting things there for the building trades uh, program to, uh, to come back to life. So that's uh, what we have to share. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. And uh, now, Bill, if you don't mind, I think we'll go to Liz because the land trust grew out of the housing commission and it's the nonprofit arm. So, Liz, do you want to talk sure. about the yeah. land trust? Sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liz Negrow with the Frankfurt Area Community Land Trust. Um, we are Frankfurt Area, which is intentional because we'd like to serve all of Benzie County, although our first projects are um, happening in Frankfurt. Um, we are a 501c3. Um, we just got that designation in March of 2020, uh, 2022, excuse me. And we are following a unique model, which is called a community land trust model. If you're not, raise your hand if you're familiar with community land trust. I might just skip over this. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about community land trust model. Um, what it does uh, essentially is it allows the land trust to to um, hold on to the land. So we retain ownership of the land. When I say we, I mean the, the community. And a homeowner is actually going to come in and buy the home. The home is going to be subsidized about 25% um, to make sure that it's affordable because as you know, entry level housing in Benzie County is extremely difficult to come by, which is why we're having to build um, our first homes as opposed to acquire. So a homeowner will come in, it'll be a qualified buyer who is somewhere in the 60 to 120% of AMI for Benzie County. Um, they'll work through NMCAA, Northern Michigan Community Action Agency, who is going to be doing all of our vetting. And they will also be doing home buyer counseling and coaching. Um, the land trust will actually be kind of arm's length from that. We won't really know who's moving into our houses until we get to hand over the keys, which is I think a good way to do it in a small community. The home buyer will move in after the homes are completed. We take delivery of the first two in May. So we're looking for them to occupy in September. And that's going to be phase one. Phase two starts as soon as the first two um, families move into their first two homes. 
They live there as long as they want. They have an 89 year lease on the land, but while it's in their possession, they can do pretty much anything they want to make it theirs. They can build a, a place set, they can build a garage, they can you know, build a shed, whatever is within zoning requirements for all intents and purposes, it is theirs. Um, the land trust retains control of the land. And the reason for that is because that will keep it attainable for the next family. So when the family that has purchased the land trust house is ready to move, let's say they've been there eight years, um, they've built up equity in the house, they will get back every penny of principal that they have paid in. And in the likely event that the house has appreciated, they will also get a certain percentage of um, the of, uh, of that increased equity as well. So they're walking out of the house with that in hand and ostensibly should be able to afford a market rate house in our community at that time. So that will free up the house for the next qualified home buyer also working through NMCAA and the next qualified family will also be in that 60 to 120%. They'll buy the house at a reduced cost, again, 25% off appraised value, keeps the home uh, affordable in perpetuity, and also makes sure that the home um, stays in our long-term year-round um, community of working individuals. So can I answer a question? Sure. Okay, so I know that's kind of an interesting model. Are there any questions on just that model before I move forward onto our project? What What is NMCA? What is that? Yep. Northern Michigan Community Action Agency. They are HUD approved um, and therefore they know all the ins and outs of um, how to work the fair housing that we need. It was much easier than us trying to get HUD certified and go through the rigmarole of placing the first families in the house. Okay. Does, does Mishka offer any single family um, types of uh, loans now? Mishka has a missing middle um, fund that we have been successful in going after the same one that uh, Jay and John had talked about. So we were able to qualify for that. We've got a guaranteed 120,000. We have to raise 400,000 more to get another 120,000 because you have to have money to get money. And um, as soon as we do that, that'll be ready for phase two of our houses. But um, yes, I, and I would say our other primary income sources have been the city of Frankfurt and the Benzie County Commissioners. Thank you so much. They made the uh, first initial investment in our group without which we could not have done any of this. Go on now and let's wait for a minute for more questions. Uh, let's hear from Habitat as an example of some of the work that's being done and then we'll open it up for questions Thank you. for everybody. Bill Mary. Um, Habitat, I'll give you a little history on Habitat before I get into the projects that we've undertaken. Um, they became an independent affiliate in 2008, uh, and since then have constructed 14 homes in various locations throughout Benzie County. Um, they're currently uh, building three homes in Thompsonville. Uh, one is about 90% complete, and the other is just simply the excavation and preparing for foundation construction next year. Uh, we target the same families the other organizations have been targeting, although most of our home buyers uh, are in the low, or not low, but middle to high $30,000 annual income. So they're very low income individuals. Um, all of our homes sell for about, well, so far we've kept the prices under $150,000. Uh, this year, we're hoping that the one house that we're, we're nearing completion on will sell for around 145. Uh, past homes in Thompsonville were all around $131,000. And that's strictly our development cost. We've just recouped that so we can reinvest it in other homes. Um, we don't make a profit on our homes. Uh, it's just a return on our investment. So as I said, we can reinvest in the communities. Um, most of the projects um, have been single family homes. Uh, we're looking uh, at doing some something a little bit different in the next year or so, uh, looking at multi-unit development where we'll have a piece of property where we can build like a, a subdivision, so to speak. Um, we're looking at a piece of property that we have um, just uh, east of Honor. Uh, it's on Helen Scott Drive. 
Um, uh, we're looking at doing uh, maybe some duplexes there, but at least doing multi units rather than one at a time, which is what we've been doing. Uh, we also have some land we're looking at in uh, Gilmore Township that I'm sure you're all aware of. And if you aren't, you haven't been reading the newspaper or watching the news, but that is an early exploration situation right now. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen there. The, a, uh, a zoning application was submitted to Gilmore Township. Uh, and that's currently being uh, reviewed by the township and also being discussed by attorneys uh, from Graceland and the township. So that's what we're looking at. We're just going to keep doing what we've been doing, uh, building single family homes and expand the multi-unit uh, developments. That's what we'll be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for your work. Okay, we have time for just a couple of questions. I mean, we could talk all day on the subject, but if there are one or two questions, we'll uh, take a couple of questions. Yeah, Stacy, back here. Bill's got one back here. Uh, the focus, I hear the word family. What about housing for single professionals? Okay. Um, Making less than 60000 a year. Liz or John, I mean, I think your units are, we have that in mind. Yeah. They're hard to fill. Is this on? Okay, I'll just go closer. Um, one bedrooms are hard to fill, and three bedrooms are hard to fill. The two bedrooms can take up to four people. A one bedroom, you know, it, it takes more land. It it's more expensive because of uh, not having a shared roof or what have you. The the thing we found is the two bedroom works best. But we do get calls for one bedrooms. A lot of single people. Um, a lot of single veterans. But um. If we can incorporate, even in some of our other plans where we have a single story additional third bedroom, we could add a one bedroom and, and see how that goes. Um, but it's just a matter of uh, market survey, market study. They tell us the absorption on one bedrooms is not as much as twos and threes. So we kind of concentrate in that area. Okay. Uh, one more question. Liz, do you want to comment on that? Or... I was just going to say that I throw the I say working families a lot because I'm talking about the missing middle, but it could just as easily um, be an individual who qualifies for the house. There, all of our homes are three bedroom, two bath right now. So, but there's no reason that an individual could not also qualify. One more. Yep. Thank you. Karen Cunningham. Um, Liz and Bill specifically. Shall I hold it for you? <laughs> okay. Um, when you build, are there HOAs that take care of the land there? Um, for the, I really don't need to. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, we don't need an HOA because it's the home is actually going to be owned by an individual or a family. Okay. So it's the same as any other traditional home ownership model. It's okay. not a community. It's not a planned or urban development. It's single family homes. Okay, and the second question, do you have an average how long people stay in the home? Eight years. And how much money do they make? I know that's a general average. Yeah, we're going off of the um, AMI charts, which are being updated for 2023 as of April of 2022, um, what they were for a single person household, it was helped me out somewhere between 45, 45 to 80 for that income range. For a two person working household, um, that means two income earners over the age of 18, okay. it was between 48 and 87. But well, that's the 60 to 120%. Perfect. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to our panel. These are incredible people that are leading the work on housing. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jack. Uh, Jack and the advocates have been on housing for many years, as you guys know. And a lot of these folks are volunteers and they're very passionate. And thank you for all the success that you guys have brought to us. All right, we're doing good, guys. It's broadband time. Tim, hopefully we didn't steal too much of your thunder, but it's a, it's a great topic. And this is uh, Tim Malone, and he's with Cherry Capital Communications. 
and we're going to talk about broadband. Thanks, Tim. So my name is Tim Malone. I'm the CEO for Cherry Capital Connection. Uh, we've been building broadband or infrastructure uh, in this region for 22 years. Uh, started off with fixed point wireless, and in 2018, we're doing 100% fiber to every home we pass. So a little different model than some of the other fiber providers. Uh, I'd like to thank Benzie County uh, Chamber for inviting us. Um, and for all the other organizations that have helped us, the, uh, the county commissioners, the EDC, um, it's very appealing to Cherry Capital uh, when a community is taking this subject matter of broadband so seriously. It's a huge investment on our part. Uh, where we build, we average uh, 9.8 houses a route mile. Uh, other providers won't touch an area unless there's 45 to 50 around my house. And that's just based on the reoccurring revenue to maintain and to get back uh, part of that uh, $50,000 a mile that cost us to go down that roadway. Uh, Benzie County has some exciting news. Uh, there are three major fiber builds happening uh, today in uh, Benzie County. Uh, we're one of them. It was federally funded uh, by the FCC under a program called RDOF, or Rural Development Opportunity Fund. Um, it covered about 25% of our cost uh, to build, uh, but uh, and that was consistent with the other two providers. I don't have an update from the other providers, so I'm just going to mention that it's going on. Uh, should should pass about 2,000 households, as I can figure. Uh, we are restricted to where we build. Uh, that money can't be used outside a specific area. Uh, since the publication of the merit study, uh, CCC has been working with uh, the commission. I happen to be at that meeting. Uh, one of the things that uh, is common is a study is done, but there's no plan in place, no direction of where to go. And so I just asked Katie um, if she'd be interested in uh, an outline of what we do. Uh, brought it to the commission 30 days later. And I think we've been talking probably six months uh, worth of time, a lot of meetings. Uh, there's a lot of great data that's out there. Um, and it's been five or six years. I remember being in Benzie during the Obama administration, uh, trying to reach, uh, gain money for Benzie County. Uh, during those discussions, the state of Michigan uh, established the Michigan High Speed Internet Office. Uh, that was done in order to meet a federal requirement. They had to put together a broadband plan. And with that broadband plan, the state of Michigan should get about $1.8 billion uh, in 2024. So that's a long ways out. We won't know the rules associated with it until the end of 2023. Uh, but our job with our public-private partnership with the county is to make sure as much of that money gets uh, to Benzie County to solve the problem. Uh, the county has put certain priorities. They want to make sure they first serve the unserved and underserved households. Um, that doesn't mean we're not allowed to connect those who have service that are unhappy with that provider. Uh, but the focus is the unserved and underserved. They also want us to take special care to look at uh, uh, households that have school-age children that may not be getting the level of broadband that they need in order to uh, uh, work within the public or uh, within the education system. Uh, also, a special focus on at-risk households, and that definition we're still working out as to what is defined as an at-risk. One of the things we are gonna do is try to follow the federal government's ACP program as a basis for being at-risk. And I'll go into what ACP is in a second. None of the money will be used for any federal or state currently funded project. This money is gonna to go to new areas within the county. And the 
state broadband plan sets a really high goals. They want 95% of all the households in Michigan to be connected at 100 by 100, which is symmetrical service, which means fiber. And uh, they hope that that kind of program will raise Michigan from number 26 to number one in the nation for broadband. So uh, to the legislators, they set a pretty high standard. And as a provider, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I think we should always shoot for the highest. Even though we're in rural areas, there's no reason why we can't have the best. So we did enter into a public-private partnership with the county. And basically that is just to establish rules. Uh, the county's role is to make sure that any public money spent is spent wisely and gets the greatest value out of it. Cherry Capital role is to do everything else. Uh, we do the construction, we do the operations, we do maintenance, all the marketing, you know, anything that it takes to get that fiber plant out there. Uh, so this, this group from the EDC and the commissioners, um, they began talking about what they didn't want to see. And one of the things they didn't want to see is they didn't want public money to go and build another monopoly. And that's a pretty common theme across our 11 counties that we uh, service today. Uh, they wanted to make sure that it provided consumer choice. If the only choice is cherry capital, that doesn't do a whole lot of good for the consumer, they need choice. Um, they also wanted uh, to establish a low cost option and they wanted it to be collaborative. We're not here to put anybody else out of business. We're here to enhance everybody that's in this business, get better at what they do. We just happen to specialize in fiber. So to, to address those concerns on affordability, uh, we are an ACP eligible telephone company which means that if you, if a customer of Cherry Capital uh, applies and finds they're eligible, they provide us that certificate and we immediately credit their monthly subscription by $30. It's up to us to go after the federal government to get that money. So all they have to do is a simple certification that's redone every year and it just got refunded. So it's probably going to be a perpetual program uh, at the federal level. Um, to provide the consumer choice, we believe we're probably going to be the first private company, uh, at least in Michigan for sure, that is going to offer an open access last mile delivery. So once your home is connected to our fiber, uh, you will be presented with a number of ISPs that can actually deliver you the internet service. Uh, this platform is used in Sweden. Uh, we brought it over here under a contract uh, to do in Michigan. We're gonna try to push this throughout the nation. Any federal money or state money should be an open access network. Uh, and we're kind of excited about that. Uh, it took us three and a half years uh, to get it here. And what uh, what uh, we'll, Open access network is it has the first layer, which is the physical infrastructure, the conduit, the bolts, the fiber. Uh, that's our responsibility. Um, the second is the lighting to make it available for use. And again, Cherry Capital takes that role. Uh, and that's called the transport. Uh, in many public uh, open access networks, the city or the village or the township or the county owns the infrastructure and then we operate in a private model, we own both the infrastructure and we operate it. Once that is operational, then we invite uh, providers like Eclipse, PFM, 186 Networks, Semtech uh, to participate and uh, use our common fiber to the home to service that customer. It may be internet, maybe phone, maybe TV, internet of things, telehealth, you name it. You know, broadband uh, is growing, the use of broadband is growing, and uh, with fiber, it's basically an unlimited resource. Um, speed may at one point just become a non-topic uh, with fiber. 
And I'm starting to imagine in Benzie County how having 95% of the households connected, what that will do for innovation. There's a lot of great minds up here. And with the right infrastructure, I can't imagine the quality of life not improving for everybody. <clears throat> So um, for collaboration, uh, we formed a uh, coalition uh, that involves Eclipse Communication and Peninsula Fiber. Peninsula Fiber is the 911 backbone. And with that, uh, that'll lay the groundwork for how the open access model will work. And then we'll invite other providers into that subject. Um, the first project associated with our public private partnership is a $5.25 million project. Um, the county has contributed 29% of the cost. Uh, and that percentage probably is gonna go down with the inflation rate because our costs are gonna go up. Uh, but uh, the county is uh, limited and restricted to only the 1.5 million. We're not gonna come back to the county uh, for anything more. It is a uh, four-year project. Our goal is to pass all the homes along the way and connect them to our mainline fiber. Uh, our biggest challenge, and this is where you as business leaders come in, is we need permission to go on property. Uh, we are a utility, we are a telephone company, but we don't have the right to enter your property. So if the vast majority of our work is knocking on doors and getting a signature, otherwise we're trespassing. The cost of bringing it from the roadway to the home is zero. Um, zero. There is a act, small activation fee once you decide to subscribe. Um, and that varies from community to community. It will not exceed $500 here in Benzie County. And that's for the entire county. So no matter what program, what funding we get, no matter how we expand, that fee won't be any greater than $500. That's one of the primary aspects of the county giving us 1.5 million. So it's not limited to just the 2,000 households that we're going after. Because there's a great deal more to do than that. Uh, so that's that project. We'll pass about 500 homes a year at minimum. Uh, we'll connect about 60 to 95% of the homes to the fiber. Uh, and we'll average somewhere around 30 to 40 miles of fiber in the ground every year as we do it. So the project is about 90 to 120 miles of fiber. And I would think that would solve about 25% of the problem in Benzie County. Uh, the, the real problem costs about 17 million to solve. We're just going to take it one step at a time. So what's, what's upcoming? Uh, the state of Michigan had $250 million uh, available uh, from their ARPA fund. They set $238 million aside for providers. And under a program called Realizing Opportunity with Broadband Infrastructure Networks, it's called Robin for short, uh, they have released the rules and we will do an application for Benzie. And the application, it started in January, mid-January, and it closes mid-March. So by March 14th, we have to get that application in. Uh, these programs are moving at light speed. Um, it used to take six months, seven months for an application. That's not going to happen in the near future. And that's where we need your help. We'll have a website up called benzie.cccfiber.com. Oh, it's a page on a website. And on that page, should be up by tonight, uh, there'll be links on there of templates. We are looking for uh, your support. There's a support, there'll be a template on there. And there's two parts of the support. One is you just support broadband and you support the effort of the county and charity capital. Another one is a letter of commitment. So if we're passing your location and you wanna make a simple statement, that uh, you would buy the service, um, then that's a letter of commitment. And we can use that to justify uh, the funding. Uh, we'll only go after the state for 35 to 40% of the project. 
uh, Cherry Capital will pick up the other 60%. We feel that that margin is probably what's going to need in that very competitive market. So uh, if you're not willing to do a letter of support or a letter of commitment, at least fill out our petition so we know where you're at. Um, that gives us an idea of why don't you have service today, what your utilities are, you know, where you're at in the county, where the best interest is for us to go. Uh, so do, as of tomorrow, <laughs> go look at the site. Uh, that's where we're going to do a report. So we've promised the county a road-by-road -road monthly report by township. It affects every township uh, in the county, and we'll give a status, and then that same report will be put on the website monthly. Can you repeat that website? It's called benzie.cccfiber.com. Charity Capital Connection was just too long for people. We got a shorter name. Uh, in 2024, as I mentioned, the BEADS program is coming up. That's broadband equity, access, and deployment. And that's the $1.8 billion. There'll be money in there for education. There'll be money in there for electronics. And there'll be money in there for uh, a development of infrastructure. Uh, the problem is, or the challenge to it, is that it's based on what's called the fabric, the broadband fabric, which is new. It was just introduced this year. Every household, every serviceable location, there's a dot on the map. And if that dot doesn't exist, the federal government says we can't fund it. So what we need you to do as owners of property and your neighbors is go to that fabric. There'll be a link on the site, make it easier for you. And if you don't see your home, make a pin. Let them know where they're at. Uh, and then we'll work with business leaders on other channel processes to make sure the most money gets to Benzie as we can. Well, Tim, uh, this is fabulous, guys. And if you don't know how other counties are doing, Benzie is really kicking it. I was just at the policy conference in Traverse City, and uh, the FCC announced that their maps are really lousy, and the investment that the county made in, in mapping and showing where all our gaps were, which anybody who had a student in, in school knew where the gaps were. But um, that allowed uh, Cherry Capital and, and everybody to kind of leapfrog and get this money. And then going after the Robin money and, and subsequent money, um, I think this is really positioning Benzie, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Benzie took a while to get there, but they are definitely leading the curve. Uh, in this region. Yeah, yeah. so you guys should be very proud of your leadership that got us here. Um, anything else, Tim? Nope, oh, I'm, I'm good. All Any right. Any questions? No, no we, yeah, we don't have time. Right. Right. So, well, thank you, Tim. Thank you. And we'll bring up Marilyn Passmore from Charter Communications to give you a little quick sponsor remark. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning. The hot mic. Test my 4-H skills and see if I can reach the back of the room without the microphone. Good morning. I'm Marilyn Passmore. I'm the state director for Charter's Government Affairs team here in Michigan, and I'm also on the rural broadband expansion team as we build out in 24 states, including Michigan. I'm gonna have Michelle be my mouse today. And uh, I wanna start just a little bit about the company. I won't read every detail on here, but in green, I highlighted that on purpose. We're at 101,000 employees, US-based employees. And I highlight that because two years ago, we were at 93,000. So we've just grown exponentially and it's all related to broadband. Um, our company is operating in 41 states, obviously here in Michigan, about 1,700 employees right here in the state with a starting pay of $20 an hour. And our Michigan operational headquarters is in Traverse City. So I always want to make sure I mention that. You can jump ahead. So a couple of years ago with the FCC RDOF program that Tim talked about, multiple providers bid for and won the right to bring broadband to rural America. And Charter was one of those companies. And with that, we launched a multi-state, multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar initiative 
that will take us over several years to build out additional million homes served. So we're very proud of this initiative. Go ahead. So this is our national map. In gray is where we are today, and in blue is where we're going. And then you can see that that federal award for charter was about 1.26 billion. Our investment is five billion. It's a massive project. And we are building, as you can see, on the eastern central part of the United States. Very exciting and very busy. Jump ahead. So this is an all fiber network built for us. And what's exciting about that is most of our network is already fiber, but the additional work that we're doing means we can actually go further. So as we're building in, in rural areas, we pass so many homes that want the service and they may have be counted as being served today, but they can pick up that additional uh, network as we go along. So we don't have data caps, we don't have modem fees, and we don't have contracts. So those are three important delineators for our company as a business. You can jump ahead, I'm going as quick as I can. So this is the uh, FCC RDOF award in Benzie County. In green is Charter, that's the CCO Holdings, that's our legal name. Um, in orange, you see Cherry's award there, and I think he mentioned they've started their build. And then Mercury Wireless is another winner that won here in the county. We are almost 50% finished. We are building like nobody's business. We came to the county a couple of years ago. I gave a high level uh, overview of what was coming and we didn't ask the county for any money. We asked for them to work with us to help remove any broadband uh, obstacles that could get in the way of our deployment and they've been great to work with. So is your road commission, by the way. Um, so with that, the north, oh, go back, sorry. <laughs> The northern part of the map, I want to just show that, is almost finished. Most of those addresses have already been lit up with service, and we are under construction in that southern portion you see in green. Also, every area that you see for us where we're kind of cutting it around, it looks like a jigsaw puzzle, we're filling in those holes. So we are building far more than we were awarded. If you notice, we were awarded over 1,300 addresses. We're building close to 1,800. So again, as our network moves, we pick up addresses along the route. This is a multi-million dollar investment for us in your county, and uh, it's very exciting to be part of it. Now you can jump ahead. So here's the most important slide right here. How do I know if I'm in the build area, near the build area, along the build area, my house, my cabin, my parents, my farm, whichever? This is a live site, Spectrum Rural Expansion. You can put in your address. You can sign up for text or email updates. And depending on where you are with respect to our network, there's different messaging. So it may say something like, we need to talk to you before you place your order, please call. And it's a designated, excuse me, a designated number for the build itself. Um, if you're truly not anywhere near our network, there's an additional message that will redirect to existing providers that are listed. But this is an interactive site that does work and I'm on it all the time. Jump ahead, Michelle, thank you. Uh, so we have to talk about uh, not just access, but adoption. So the reality is our network passes 55 million addresses, and we have 32 million customers. So there still are people that do not take the service, and it can be lack of education. It can be lack of comfort being online. It can be a cost factor. So in 2016, and I, I put some of these flyers in the back of the room, we launched a program called Spectrum Internet Assist, and that offers 30 meg internet for $19.99. It's available to kids, families on free and reduced lunch, which you know is a large proportion of your county. It's also uh, for low income house, uh, students, seniors, pardon me, that can qualify. Again, no contracts, no day caps, no modem fees. Um, additionally, we do participate in the Federal uh, Affordable Connectivity Program, and I, again, put some other flyers in the back. And that's an important program to talk about because, again, it offers a $30 offset on your monthly broadband bill, and you don't have to be connected to a wired provider like us. There are a host of other companies that are participating, and it's got a broad uh, base by which to qualify. So for a lot of the nonprofits here, this is one you're going to want to know about. If you have uh, constituents that participate in SNAP, Medicaid, federal housing, supplemental uh, security income, WIC, 
uh, veteran pension, all of those components qualify for that monthly $30 offset. So that, that's a really important takeaway and I'm, I'm happy to talk about you after the, after the meeting. Um, and then have you jump ahead, thank you. So Tim touched about broadband grants. There's, as he mentioned, 238 million been set aside by the Michigan uh, Robin office that's open now. And then what's coming from the federal infrastructure bill, we estimate between 1.5 and 1.8 billion. Um, I believe charter will also apply for a Robin grant to build out the additional portions of the county. Um, we are well positioned to offer a countywide approach. We already have existing network, we're already building more network. And again, our, our build is going rapid fire. Under the FCC program, we get six years to build it. We're going to be done this year. Uh, provided there's no issues with permitting or any other types of delays. So it's it's an exciting time to be in this industry and there's certainly no shortage of opportunities for us all. Um, and I think there's a, there's room at the table for everybody. So happy to share that. And then oh, that's the last slide. So, so yeah, try to keep it under five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Oh, you did a, a great job. And, and you know, because of the road back map again that the county uh, laid out, um, our partners with Eclipse and Charter and Cherry Capital are all getting it done. All right, I think our Ch Janat had mentioned that uh, we need to build infrastructure. And this to me is one of the most exciting things happening in Benzie County. Uh, Jason Barnard's gonna talk to you about uh, the Beulah Benzonia uh, water initiatives. Jason Barnard. Jason Bard, I'm the supervisor of Benzonia Township. Um, it, it's not really a water plan. Uh, currently, it's more of a water dream. You know, if you live here, we, we struggle with uh, the high water table and clay um, through the US 301 corridor. Eula has, has sewer, but Benzoni doesn't. Um, so the idea would, is to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's a feasibility study. Which is funded by the county, township, and both villages. Uh, county and township both spent forty thousand uh, dollars, paid for by recreational marijuana excise tax revenue, um, and, and then ten thousand piece from the both villages for a hundred thousand dollars total. Contract with Wade Trim uh, out of Traverse City to uh, to put this feasibility study together. Um, Beulah, let's see what can I get out of it. Beulah's got some issues that they need to deal with right away. Uh, so initially it was the idea with all three of us form a sewer authority to apply for a grant or um, a, a low interest uh, interest or loans from uh, USDA RV or uh, Eagles um, SRF fund. So uh, with Beulah having to get stuff done immediately, it's more like, uh, it's, it's looking like it's going to be the township and the village of Benzonia uh, forming the authority. Um, but uh, that doesn't, doesn't mean we, we still can't work together. You know, uh, I think one of the uh, one of the ideas would be uh, there would be three at the end of the day options for uh, for sewer. One would be obviously working with Beulah, um, that may be being a customer or working into their system that currently in place. Um, Frankfurt has Blua, another option or a completely separate um, treatment facility in itself. So the plan would be that uh, we try to put together you know, these options, um, uh, different things that come along with that. We're gonna have a, a, a public meeting in three weeks from tomorrow. So the seventh and we're hoping it to be here. I'm not completely sure yet. But um, you can get that information from myself and County Commissioner Ron and I. Um, who's been a big, big part of this as well. But that's pretty much it. I mean, the idea is just to to, to get this study put together. Uh, hopefully, get sewer down the US 31 corridor. You know, obviously, we have a lot of uh, lake frontage homes that suffer from uh, holding tanks high water tables as well. So uh, expansion around the world would be nice as well, but initially the 31 corridor and uh, 
helping out Beulah as much as possible is the idea. Well, that was fun. Well, that's, um, we have really exciting, my gosh, um, with the infrastructure, you can get affordable housing, you can get more density. And one of the things as a historian I learned is that um, our soil isn't great around here, right? Um, after they took the trees out, uh, they tried to share crop it and nothing would really grow here. Some fruit trees do, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, as Jason alluded to, um, uh, the water um, sheds and stuff have, have told us that um, this is the long-term solution. So really excited about that. Okay, Mark Roper talking about his new master plan. Come on down, Mark. Everybody know Mark Roper from Amara Township? Amara Township, that's over there, that very element over there. So. A uh, little plug for Jason and myself. We're both on the land bank. And these projects in Habitat, a uh, project in Honor, that all stem from what the land bank done, mm -hmm. just so you guys know. Um, there's $50,000 that the land bank um, spent to take that building down in Honor so that that lot could be available. And now we have a, a really nice housing project going on there. So I just thought I needed to do that for Jason and I a little bit there. And there's some other good people on that committee too. Um, thanks, Michelle. Thanks uh, to the chamber for inviting me over here and stuff. Uh, we're doing a master plan update. I mean, everybody knows you kind of do that every 10 years. Um, so we just have gotten into that over the last year and we're bringing up our master plan in our township. Um, it's uh it's been a little longer project than I thought it would be. Uh, we're waiting on the 2020 census numbers yet, if you can believe that. And it's 2023, and we still haven't gotten them. So uh, they're kind of just got everything put together for it, and uh, we're just waiting on those numbers. Once those numbers get in, I think we can plug things in. We'll be in good shape. So um, just a few things about our uh, just a. I don't know if everybody knows um, some of the things that uh, we have over there or not. So I, I thought I'd just do a little history on that for you. Um, we have three three parks over there. Um, our main park is 60 acres where our fire department is, where our offices are, we have a walking trail, we have three ball fields there. Uh, disc golf. Can we play disc golf here? Okay, Phil, yeah, you play disc golf. Our recreational committee came to us and said, we want an 18-hole disc golf in our park. And I said, well, that's a waste of money. That's going to be something like I really want to put the bill on and then explain to my taxpayers why we spent 18, or why we spent the money on 18 holes in disc golf. There's never a day that there's not somebody out there playing the sport. Um, so it is a very, very popular sport, and they play it all winter long. They're out there in their snowshoes throwing things around. So I did, I did, it beyond me, but they, that's the way it goes. So, uh, but anyway, we got a nice walking trail there and stuff. So uh, our park is, is is doing pretty well. Um, we we've got a another 220 acres of ranch lake natural area that we have a complete lake on. A walking path around that lake. Um, that was uh, that, and and we have a beach downtown on two acres, right in the village of Lake Ann. That's right on the water um, for people to be able to swim and enjoy the water's edge. Um, those two, and those last two entities were done in conjunction with uh, Grand Traverse Regional Land Conservancy and also the preservation group that we had in that community to raise the funds to do that. And they raised uh, close to $300,000 over there to do that. So we have a very good uh, core of people that when they want something, they go after it. So um, right now, uh, just just some budget numbers. I'm working on budgets. Uh, when you talk about a census and, and where we're headed and where we're going in the future, 2010, uh, my general fund budget over there is about $350,000. Um, I just put my new budget together to take to my board tonight to approve to go into April 1st for our new year. It's $745,000. That's how much of money that we are going up in our budgets to maintain what we have there and keep doing what we're doing. So um, some, of the, some of the biggest things that we have, obviously, uh, that are changing. Um, 
voter registration, voter registration, uh, 2012, 20, about 2,800 people registered vote. Uh, we're up to 3,350 now registered voters in our community. Uh, with that increase, it's going to put us into, we need two precincts now. So with two precincts, we're going to have to go to the expense of separating and having two different voting areas in our community for people to vote. Um, hopefully, we're, with that, we're hoping with that and the new voting laws that came out and what we have to do there, which uh, as far as I know, I'm not really sure what's gonna, what we're going to do, um, we're going to have some costs there. So with those costs, maybe the state can help us a little bit, but we will have some additional costs there. Um, we have a really, really good EMS department over there. We run uh, 10 hour shifts, seven days a week, and then we do on call for all the other hours that we have. With that seven hours and uh, with that uh, seven days, 10 hours a week uh, shift, um, we had in 2012, we had 147 runs a year, emergency runs and fire runs together. This year, in 2022, at the end of the year, we ended up with, uh, oh, where's that right here? 363. That's how much we've jumped over the last 10 years in emergency runs. Um, and with that, we're supplementing, we have a millage, one and a half mil for our EMS department. With that, we're supplementing another $100,000 out of the general fund just to operate our EMS services. So we're going to have to go to the voter sometime soon. Ask for additional money. Hopefully, it's uh, it's just what we need, or uh, you know what I, we don't want to go to a twenty four seven service. It's awful costly, but we may be kind of getting to that point. I don't know. So, um, so anyway, uh, with that, we are we are looking at those expenses moving ahead, and what we're going to do to do that. This is all. You know, it all follows of what you do as far as your plan for the future, you know, the master plan that you have for the future. So we do have a little bit of ARPA funds, as all the government entities know. They got a few ARPA funds. Uh, we've, we took some of it and put it toward the new tanker. Our tanker was 20 years old for our fire department. So we did put some funds towards that. We still have some other, the board's going to sit and talk about where they want to spend those monies, hopefully with some input from the electors and find out where they'd like to see some of those funds go to improve our, our area. So um, I would I like to address the planning just a little bit. Again, Art, when we were talking about a planner for the county, I think that would be a good idea because we're using Network Northwest for our planning. Um, and I believe that all the townships and zoning and everything we've got going in this in this county could use a planner to help every one of them do their updates of their master plans and stuff. So I think it would be a positive thing if we could go down that road a little bit and see what could be done. I know there's a cost, but I, I tell you, we pay for that process to be done, and I think we could do it better in house sometimes if if we had people in the facility. So any questions for me? I probably went over my time, but yeah, Arch and I go ahead. Yeah. And it's it's kind of an anomaly in Benson County because we have a really close fit with Travers when you get it when you're, you're right in Benson County. How do you manage the needs that kind of pull you in two different directions? Well, you know, ever since I was commissioner, I was in your spot for 10 years, and then I jumped to supervisor. I've been there for 10 years, and it's 20 years. I should be retired by now. Um, but uh, the thing, I think the thing is, is that we do have, we do have a demographic that comes from Traverse City that wants to live in our area. And why do they want to live there? Well, they want to live there because we are associated with Benzie County. And Benzie County is associated with a place that you want to live. I mean, that's that's kind of the connection that we have there. Everybody kind of wants to come here to live. We are fortunate because we sit next to a metropolitan area that can supply jobs for some of those people. So they do work and get some of their income, but a lot of that income comes back into our county 
through our township and through different things that we provide. So we, as we move through that, think about how we can do that everywhere is to bring income, bring people here, but make something sustainable for them to stay here so that they can work here and stuff. Mm -hmm. Sir, yeah. that is a wonderful topic. We've had property over there for years and that park has been developed and it is just beautiful and the kids use it all so no, it's just a wonderful part of this Thank you. Thank you. I'm told it is the best guilt, uh, disc golf course too. So I've been told that too. Yes. <laughs> well guys, so um, yeah, um, so we appreciate the leadership that Jason and Mark bring as um, supervisors and um, for non-elected people, how many townships and villages do we have in Benzing County? Anybody want to make a guess? Higher. Higher. With the township and the villages. And, and villages. There's 18 plus Frankfurt City makes 19 municipalities in the smallest county in the state of Michigan. So we, we appreciate um, the master plan update and we want to afford the various townships and villages to share at this forum, but that's a lot. So um, if you guys uh, want to bring something next year uh, to this, um, we, we certainly would welcome that, but um, we're trying to respect everyone's time and keep this very tight. Thank you for that, Thank David. You, Bill, for I'm Chris Strobe. Um, we have two sponsors today that pay for your breakfast and lunch, and we appreciate that because $5, I know you think that's a lot of money, but really it doesn't really cover the fees for this, Chris. Thank you. I'll be quick. So yeah, my name is Chris Taub. Uh, I lead our Northern Michigan uh, team. And for Blue Cross, Northern Michigan is really Manistee across the Tawa City all the way to the bridge. So like many of you, we're covering a lot of territory, but it is um, a privilege for us to be a sponsor of the Benzie Chamber in this event. So I'm glad to be here today. And so I'm just gonna leave you with two thoughts today. As we continue to emerge from COVID, one of the things that we see is that people are not back in the habit yet of getting an annual physical or getting certain screenings, depending on our age and our male female status. Uh, so I'm encouraging you to do that, whether you're with Blue Cross or not, that is important. And uh, the front of the year is usually a good time to do that because we're trying to take care of a lot of business things. And many of us have plans that cover those things at 100%. So if you're not sure, check your plan out. But I would encourage you definitely to get a physical this year. And then secondly, February, if you don't know this, is Go Red Month. It is Women's Heart Health Month. It is important. Um, event. It's an important month to remember because most of the people that have issues with their heart uh, and sometimes with fewer symptoms are the females in our families and in our communities. Uh, so I would just encourage any of you who are um, who have a, a family member who has had some heart issues or is at risk for heart health to just be aware of that and or encourage people to go get, again, physical or get a screening. So that's it. With that, I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you very much. All right, and we have uh, Frankfurt Chamber. Andrew, thanks to share everything that's happening in Frankfurt. Thanks, Bill. Um, and uh, thank you to all the speakers here today. Uh, incredible what uh, is going on in such a small county, smallest county. Um, as uh, Bill said, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm the president of the Frankfurt, Alberta Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm here on behalf of our board, as well as our executive director, Joanne Bartley, who's here. Um, uh, we represent over 100 uh, businesses all across Benzie County. And uh, we also directly work with a number of other local organizations like the City of Frankfurt, uh, the Frankfurt Downtown Development Authority, Traverse City Tourism, and as well as the Benzie County Chamber. Um, and we do that to support uh, the growth of our uh, all the businesses in our community. Um, our chamber is a little bit different um, because we focus primarily on tourism, and that's partly because that's what uh, the businesses that we work with mostly are. Um, there's a lot of other mom and pops and other things like my business, uh, an insurance agency that aren't directly tourism related, but 
a lot of uh, that trickles on down to us through people uh, moving to our community or seasonal part of our community. Um, at the present, the most pressing question I get is, uh, where is our chamber going to be located? If you don't know, uh, we have left our 517 Main Street location, and we're currently uh, in discussion with a number of different places as to where we're going to be. Um, part of that is also with our board trying to focus on what might work best for us going forward. And we have some really interesting ideas, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. So uh, keep your uh, eyes to the paper or to social media to see where we end up. Um, um, in the last year, uh, we were lucky enough to partner with a number of organizations um, that brought fun and business to our community. Um, some of those being uh, Charter City Tourism, once again, the DTE and DTE's Foundation, um, and a number of our local corporate sponsors as well who are there to support what we do to try to grow and improve um, all of us. So some of these uh, events that you may not know that we partner in, uh, the Michigan Ironman, Frankfurt Alberta Restaurant Week, uh, Benzie Fishing Frenzy, Frank Fall Festival, and uh, as well as Frankfurt's wonderful uh, Fourth of July fireworks, all things that are larger events. Uh, but things also small local events like Let's Fly a Kite, Take a Kid Fishing, and even the Frankfurt Easter Egg Hunt are things that we do that kind of happen sometimes behind the scenes. And that's kind of what our organization is happy to do. Um, our intent isn't to take credit for these things because it's not really what we're about. We're about being more successful, having our businesses be more successful, and having fun things for people to in our community. Um, we're looking forward to growing all of these events, as well as adding new things, as well as growing our membership. And uh, because each of us that are partners are business owners, and we're looking to just improve where we live and what we love. Um, our membership is increasing as well as uh, by doing that, increasing these events also increases the financial stability of our community as a whole. And that's kind of just a quick update on what's going on with Frankfurt Chamber. And if anybody has any questions, please reach out to Joanne or myself anytime. Thank you. And the Benzie Chamber has a new fearless leader. Everyone knows her from Oliver Art Center, but now she's with the foundation, but wearing lots of hats. We're safe. Hello. And I'm just going to correct Bella Jeshley University. <laughs> it happens a lot. I know many of you in the room are like, yeah. So I just want to take a few minutes to thank our sponsors for today, to thank our speakers, and then to thank all of you for coming and attending. Um, your chamber is working hard to represent the business community um, to improve social and economic development in the Benzie area. So we are a membership-based organization. If you're not a member, please consider joining. If you are a member, please consider upgrading. A um, couple of quick announcements. There is lunch in the lower level um, for anybody who wants to come down and network a little bit more or grab something to go, free to do either. The next event we have is the, uh, let's see, the off the clock. Let's see, gotcha. gotcha. Um, it is Mardi Gras themed at Grove NZ, Thursday, February 23rd from 5 to 7. Uh, it is being sponsored by Weber Insurance, Dingy's, Grove NZ, and Lake Ann Brewing. And then after that, we have our annual chamber dinner and awards celebration. So that is where we honor our outstanding business of the year and our Community Impact Award. That's Thursday, March 23rd from 5 to 8. We are currently seeking sponsors and tickets are on sale. Um, so again, I just want to thank everybody for attending today. I think it was a great day of learning and listening. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll kind of follow Andrew. You can follow up with Michelle, Director of the Chamber. Um, and thanks again for coming. I'll build it. Bill, are you done talking? You're just over it now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you, for coming today. I hope you've learned something. Um, some of our speakers and organization have left little takeaways on the table in the back. Please feel free to do that. If you want to learn more about the Benzie Chamber, um, I do have some literature. Our new directory is out, hot off the presses. So grab one of those. Um, if you want to know what we're doing, there's an update over there as well. 
Um, our Advocacy and Awareness Council is a subgroup of our chamber. Bill Kennis is our chairman, and we meet quarterly. We talk about legislation. We talk about like, economic development specifically, and this is where uh, this event falls under that umbrella. But thank you, and please go downstairs. Join us for lunch. Cherry Lane, the Black Drake, Courtney, Rachel, and their team have been graciously uh, sponsored that event, and we would love for you to join us. And that's the way up. And you can go that way, or you can use the elevator to step on talking. So thank you so much, and thank you.